2009, it's a continuation of the, to the uh, ancient VLDA Latin dependency tree that was started a little earlier in uh, 2007. And uh, as we will see in a while, uh, it has reached quite a substantial status, so it's uh, rather important. And it promises to grow uh, even more with the uh, uh, initiatives of the uh, Uncle Chair uh, in Leipzig. Okay, so first of all, I am sure everybody is asking uh, a question. What are three banks? Uh, in current linguistics, uh, three banks are corporate, especially digital corporate, uh, that is collection of texts. Uh, that are considered to be representative of a language and can provide uh, a resource for empirical study of a language or a substratum of a, of a language. Corpora that are enriched where every token, every word, uh, every sentence is enriched with some metadata about linguistic uh, feature. And first of all, and primarily, a part of speech, if a word is a verb, noun, or an adjective, etc., and other morphological information, like the lemma, every word belongs to, or is uh, categorized in a, in a lexicon, uh, or and other uh, information about inflection, especially in a, a language like the ancient Greek or Latin that are very rich in inflection. But also, it's a corpus where uh, every sentence and every word within its sentence uh, is described for the syntactic relation that this uh, words entertain, and uh, typically these uh, relations are represented, can be represented in the form of trees, like in this very simple example here. Thanks to the initiatives of the Pursuit Project, uh, Professor Crane here, uh, we do have an, uh, a tree bank, a corpus of ancient Greek texts where every uh, sentence in the text and every word within the sentence is annotated with information about morphology and the syntax of the sentence is represented with a formalism that you can uh, see exemplified in the image uh, over there. And uh, you can see why it is called a dependency uh, tree bank. Because words, unlike in this simple example, uh, the English simple example before, are connected directly one to each other with a formalism that we think it's uh, pretty natural for, some, for people that come from uh, a classic background, their background uh, ancient and Greek, uh, in ancient Greek and Latin grammar. Uh, typically, a, word, a verb is the head of a sentence, subject depends on verb, direct objects depends on verb, adjective depends on the noun, or in this example, for example, uh, the verb of a relative sentence depends on the noun, the relative sentence is attached to uh, articles, are attached to the noun, so it depends on the noun. And these dependency relations are described with a series of tags that I won't describe, but some of them are very uh, intuitive, like object for object, uh, art for attributes, or uh, uh, adverb for adverbial, etc. And uh, uh, here is where we stand right now, at the last uh, release of the ancient Greek dependency tree 1.7. As you can see, uh, we have a quite a substantial con uh, collection of Greek poetry, especially. The prose at the moment is just represented by one dialogue of Plato, the uh, Eutypho. Uh, but we have the complete work of the seven uh, tragedy traditionally attributed to Aeschylus, five tragedies of Sophocles, the Philoctetes and the Oedipus that Colossus are missing, and the whole text of the Iliad and the Odyssey, etc. Uh, when we ask ourselves what the treatment is good for, uh, probably the first answer that we came up with is linguistic research. Let me give you an example. Uh, we all know very much, or it's pretty well known, that uh, in Greek, coordinated uh, subjects like John and Paul can trigger either a plural agreement, like in regular English, John and Paul run, or singular agreement, like in uh, fictive English, John and Paul runs. But did you know, for example, that uh, in the corpus that I showed you before, the singular agreement is predominant, is indeed predominant, except that when the subjects are two human, uh, two human beings. So in, like in the example before, John and Paul. And this is basically the only case where when two subjects uh, are coordinated, uh, we find a dual agreement. I didn't know that. This is an example from an ongoing research uh, 
that I hope to publish someday about in the uh, in on this topic. But I don't want to uh, to concentrate on this aspect and how three names are uh, can be exploited. Rather, I will uh, insist mainly on the process of how three names are creating and on the annotation process itself uh, because I would like to. Uh, explore a little bit the uh, interaction between uh, annotation and text and the interaction between these two models. One that comes from computer modern uh, and current computational linguistics about annotating and using annotated, uh, annotated corpora, and the model of annotation we are familiar with coming from a, a more traditional uh, philological background, the one with uh, annotated editions going back to the Alexandrian library, the library of Alexandria. And I will uh, take you, if you want, on a small uh, uh, experiment, uh, rerun uh, experience that I made myself while I was annotating Sophocles. And I will take one sentence from the uh, fourth stasi from Sophocles, uh, uh, Women of Trachis, uh, where the chorus first realized that the uh, dying uh, Heracles is brought to the scene. And uh, when they began uh, the fourth stasium, uh, the people of Trachis were asking themselves uh, what was worse, the evil that they knew, the death of the you know, that they ever heard in school, or the evil that they were expecting, the fact that Heracles is coming to the stage and he's dying right on the stage, and he's coming to die, a very painful death on the stage. And so uh, they... Right now, they realize that they hear that Heracles is coming uh, in the, the scene, uh, on the scene, and so they uh, they utter this sentence. So they say, "Near and not far, far off, whatever it means." Uh, we wet beforehand like the shrill voice nightingale, and we will see what the, uh, how we can interpret this. So, first of all, why this sentence? And the first answer is, why not? <laughs> because uh, when you're treating a text, you don't pick and choose. You don't say, okay, this sentence is boring, let's move to the next one. <laughs> let's go to the, I don't know, the second uh, uh, stasium of the Edipus Rex or some the passages that you think yes, immediately associate with something. You have to annotate every sentence <laughs> and every single day and chi within, or every single punctuation mark within the sentence. But the interesting thing is that maybe why you do that, why you annotate every single day, guy, you discover that those sentences that were easily overlooked while reading can be very interesting and potentially a source of new of problems or a source of or a new way to rediscover uh, traditional problems. And so uh, I will take you with me on this journey. So let's start. First thing we need to do is annotate the morphology. And if you use the Perseus uh, uh, annotation interface, this comes preloaded with uh, the uh, morphological uh, analysis done by the morphological analyzer in the Perseus library. And all an annotator has to do is disambiguate the ambiguous uh, cases, or maybe if you discover some error or some information missing, add some new uh, information. Uh, in this case, there's nothing particularly ambiguous, just one thing, as you may expect the verb proclion which can be interpreted as an indicative imperfect first person singular or an indicative uh, uh, imperfect third person plural. And there is not very much to choose, you may, you may say, and indeed you would be right, but you may be interested to know that the other interpretation, the third person plural, they, went, they were weaving beforehand, but that is actually attested in the history of uh, interpretation of this passage. And it's, the, it's the one that you can read in the... Uh, in the scolium. And if you read it, you will understand pretty quickly that this interpretation is absurd, it's rather absurd, but if we are in a class, for example, it can be interesting to ask our students why it is absurd, or what do we get more, what, what more in, uh, interesting information we get from the other interpretation, meaning that uh, the chorus uses at the first person a verb that it's referring to, the, that's connected to the act of lamentation, the dirge, and it's very interesting, and of course we have the traditional problem of the, uh, uh, the alternatives between the first uh, person singular and first person plural in the chorus, uh, uh, in green in tragic choruses, and don't forget that we have a corpus that we can ask this information. Uh, 
too, and we can uh, easily retrieve all these cases of uh, uh, interaction. The same thing goes with the syntax when we start to build the tree and to connect the words. I won't go into detail uh, on the uh, formalism that we use to represent the, uh, the similitudes, but the important thing that I want to stress here is that do we do have a formalism. So again, it would be pretty easy to ask, uh, to query the corpus, to extract all the similitudes, and for example, to study this very important uh, theme, the Nightingale motive. And uh, don't forget that we have the whole text of the Iliad and Odyssey, so important source of similitude. But then we will have to give a construction to these two adverbs, near and not far off. Uh, and here the problem uh, would start, because this is a very, very puzzling uh, sentence. Uh, probably the best thing to do in this case would be to just revise the other interpretations that were given before in the long history of the scholarship of South. And so, for example, we would see that the vast majority of the uh, scholars around uh, tend to think that uh, we, we need to provide a construction uh, that, that represents uh, what we logically uh, think, that what is near and far, what is getting nearer to the chorus, is the object of this, uh, that they are lamenting, and so either uh, earless or a more general uh, notion like this evil, uh, this new evil, something like that. So the solution that two important, uh, the very famous uh, scholars of uh, Sophocles, like uh, Gottfried Hermann and Richard Jeb, uh, devised was just to supplement a participle of the verb to be that could govern uh, these, two, uh, these two adverbs. And this is reflected also in the most uh, widespread English translation, like the, the one by Lloyd Jones from the uh, most recent edition of Sophocles. It would be pretty easy to uh, diagram, to tree bank this interpretation. Keep in mind that if we introduce a note that is missing, a word that is missing, it's not there, it's implied, we don't have to provide this word. I will do that in some of the diagrams that we will, but just for the clarity's sake. We don't have to. All we have to do is just mark with a stop that something is missing, and that something uh, fills the role of a direct object. As Jed saw, this is a pretty bold construction, and we have some parallels, but they're not quite the same thing. So other interpretations are possible, and indeed other interpretations are tested. Uh, like, for example, in this commentary of Sophocles, Kammerbeck uh, referred these adverbs back to the chorus itself, so that the chorus is standing near and not far off from the from Heracles, of course, were lamenting before. And this interpretation is entirely compatible with this way of diagramming uh, the sentence of this phrase. Uh, we can even diagram and accept into our tree bank some, uh, uh, read, uh, some more radical interpretation. Like, for example, if we think that, like Longo in his uh, linguistic commentary did, that uh, Macran Proclaion refers, which is more natural with Macran with verbs of uh, uttering uh, words or, uh, or singing, uh, refers to the extension, to the temporal extension of the, the discourse. So I didn't mourn for a long time. And so we have some, uh, some sort of a double uh, way of uh, intending Proclaion with a spatial uh, verb and uh, adverb, and then rather it moves to a, uh, a Proclaion with the temporal. With temporal adverb, we can do that, and it would be purely compatible. Again, the second proof layer, proof layer on the left, which is in uh, between brackets, uh, it's there for you to, to see, but it won't be there. It wouldn't be there in the, in the actual tree bank. Maybe we can even go as, uh, further in this direction and think that the the, uh, the sentence does not have. Uh, a complete, a coherent uh, structure, but this anku was the beginning, was left there hanging somehow, as we do sometimes in oral, uh, in oral speech, and uh, is left without a proper construction. We would have a tag to signify this as well. Uh, in the end, when you trip back, you have to take a decision. And 
So, for example, I didn't believe that uh, the uh, parallels are in favor of the Hermann's uh, uh, construction, and so I rather went with the uh, solutions of Kammerbeck and interpreted the latter. And this is again how the final version that I gave that is uh, visualized in the interface, in the three-back interface. This would be the result. It's not the actual sentence, but anyway, this would be the, the formal structure where, the, where this interpretation is stored. And uh, this couple of uh, uh, tags that I illustrate in this XML file where the three banks actually stored uh, refers to the information of morphology on syntax. Professor Crane often uses the image of a genome of a Greek literature. Uh, that could be encoded in this format. And I think it's a very nice image. Something is missing, though, over there. Uh, we may ask how we could integrate all the work that we did with the other interpretation and uh, how we can uh, uh, warn, for example, users of the three days that there are some, uh, that there is some de de debate over there. Why not, for example, use this uh, interface for uh, cooperative commentary that uh, Monica referred to before, like Persis. After all, every word, every token in the tree bank has a unique identifier that can be easily converted to the a CTS URI and then link to a uh, comment uh, in this uh, interface. So we can see, say, okay, I accepted the, the, uh, the interpretation of Camerbeck and did not accept the most widespread interpretation. And uh, this is a very stupid mock-up of something that I have in mind, that it's of this kind of interaction, for example, we can, where we can visualize the tree back and we can visualize uh, comments from the, uh, from the, from the first setting interface. So, to sum up, well, I hope I succeeded in illustrating to you that three banks are a powerful tool for linguistic research, but are also a word-by-word -word linguistic commentary that can allow us, students and scholars at whatever level, to analyze questions of language, style, literature, and uh, literary genres, revise the history of interpretation like we did very briefly here, and probably reinvent some of the age-long tradition of textual commentary.